Okay, good afternoon, colleagues. Sure, I'm audible that side. Uh, yes, you are. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Ndaba. Colleagues, thank you very much for joining today's webinar, uh, COVID-19 webinar series that has been a ship for health in collaboration with the Ministry of Health and UB. So every week, we have um, webinars on different COVID-19 topics where we invite different experts in the medical field to come and educate us as healthcare workers on the, as well as the law. Today, the focus will be on genomics of SARS-CoV-2 in Botswana a special on variants of concern and interest. My name is Dr. Pumolimo Smith. Uh, I am with the Ministry of Health. I'm an employee and I'm currently in my residency in public health medicine during my third year at the university. Next slide, we see. Okay, if you want to receive invitations every week to our, uh, to our webinars, you can send an email to vindaba at globalhealth.radgus.edu and you will be added to the mailing list. Um, so these sessions are held every week over Zoom and um, you can use the chat function to Ask, uh, ask your questions, any questions that you have, and we'll be monitoring those questions as they come in. And the presenter will be able to address. Also know that these sessions are being recorded and they're made available on the YouTube page, the Botswana uh, Radgas Partnership for Health YouTube page where you can access the different sessions. So that's the, the YouTube page where the different webinars are posted. So you can have access even to the previous um, webinars that have been held. And then there's uh, the government uh, portal the COVID-19 portal where you have access to different documents. You just go to the document library where you can access all the available guidelines on COVID-19. So that's just a sample of the list of the guidelines that are available there on the COVID-19 government portal. So today, like I mentioned, we the focus will be on genomics of SARS, especially on variants of will be um, a discussion that will be led by Dr. Sikuli Lemoyo. And at the end of this presentation, as participants, you will be able to um, have your, your questions that he will address at the end of his presentation. Dr. Sikuli Lemoyo is a virologist and a, labor a laboratory director at the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute Partnership. He is a research associate with the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health. He also serves as a co chief scientist with the COVID 19 task force team and is an adjunct senior lecturer at the University of Botswana. He has made significant contribution in the design and conduct of clinical trials, observational as well as surveillance studies, and has mentored several students and fellows. He has 147 publications in different peer-reviewed journals 
And recently he was honored by the NIH funded networks, International Maternal Pediatric and AIDS Clinical Trials or IMPACT, as well as the AIDS Clinical Trials Group for his contributions to design and implementation of clinical trials. So really Dr. Moyo is the right person to be presenting on this topic today. Dr. Moyo, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, just uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, for your introduction. I just want to make sure that I'm loud and clear. One person can say, yeah. Yay. Okay, that's nice. That's good. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, I had the, the, the convenience saying I'm the best person to speak on this. There are many, many others who can uh, do an excellent job. I count it a privilege to have an opportunity to be able to, to share some of the data uh, that has been generated in Botswana and the contribution of other scientists whom I, I, I am privileged to represent today. Uh, so the focus of this talk will be really trying to understand our variants, uh, what are they, uh, uh, and uh, why is it important for us to really look at uh, pathogen genomics, and what are some of the results that we see in the region and what we see here at home. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, this will take about 40 minutes or so, I hope. Um, this is the global burden um, of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, that we have seen an outstanding 187 million confirmed cases globally and uh, uh, 4.1 million deaths. Uh, and, uh, and as you can see, Africa, 6.1 million confirmed cases and 155 deaths. And, and uh, the number of tests, uh, uh, 56 million tests has been conducted uh, uh, in Africa. Uh, if you just look at uh, the, the map and the epic curve uh, for Africa, you can see that um, uh, Southern Africa is, is really um, the leading contributor of all the cases. And there is uh, um, currently about two countries that have recorded more than 500,000 cases. And we have eight countries that are between 100,000 to 500,000 uh, 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 cases. Uh, and, and we have um, 30 countries that are between 10,000 and 100,000 cases. And uh, beginning last year and really ramping up uh, uh, sometime early this year, uh, pathogen genomics became very, very important in understanding uh, the, the transmission dynamics of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, Africa as a whole has generated about 24,600 uh, uh, sequences, whole genome sequences. Uh, this was unheard of uh, early, uh, some time late last year, when there was almost like uh, less than 1,000 uh, sequences, mostly uh, coming from South Africa. Um, this, you are familiar with the epidemic situation in Botswana, and these slides really tell us that things are heating up. The cumulative number of cases, you can see that we are definitely in, a, in another wave. And you can see that from May, we have uh, a, a, an exponential increase in cases. And you can see also vaccination uh, uh, rates uh, on the left side. And also you can see that um, uh, we have hit some of the highest numbers we have seen in a three, four day period of 3,800 uh, confirmed cases. Uh, if you look at um, uh, 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 this, the epic curve as well, you can see uh, the trend in mortality uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, uh, the numbers on your right there that we had are some of our highest mortality in March. And, uh, and in June, you see that we are, uh, we are at 204. And if you see the average daily mortality cases on your own at the bottom there, hovering around uh, uh, eight to nine cases. And um, if you take a snapshot of one day, for example, to see that there's a changing epidemiology of, of, of SARS-CoV-2, you can see that uh, 
uh, the, the, the number of cases that were now coming from the younger age group is seemingly increasing. And, and, and I'm highlighting this because to understand the importance of pathogen genomics, because this coincides with, uh, with uh, 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 the spread or the incoming in of a new variant that may be causing some of this shift in the epidemic. Uh, this is a, a, a slide uh, from uh, John Hopkins. They do this uh, looking at the incidence of, of COVID-19. Uh, this is the 14-day moving average, just comparing uh, the, the countries uh, around us. You can see that uh, Namibia has also been having a, a high exponential increase uh, in terms of cases. Uh, what is represented here is really uh, new cases uh, 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 pay, pay 100,000. And you can see that ourselves in South Africa almost mirroring each other. And then we have our neighbors uh, uh, below. Um, just to look at the same data, uh, uh, looking at uh, in a different way, um, but now looking at uh, vaccinations per million, um, you can see uh, this. Uh, uh, data from the One World uh, uh, data that is showing us that, uh, of course, the numbers of vaccination uh, in terms of uh, or absolute numbers, we may be lower, but in terms of comparison with the other regions in percentages, uh, um, uh, we, we are up there. Um, so why are we talking about this topic today uh, and its impact in the epidemic? If you look at uh, the, the, the importance of why we should sequence, uh, just to remind you that um, uh, in order for this virus to be characterized and, 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 and be characterized, there had to be a sequencing of the virus, which was very important to look at uh, uh, in the family of the coronaviruses. Uh, there was this unique uh, uh, virus that was, was identified. There's still a lot of discussions around around the, 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 the origins. But what we see is that the sequence was very, very important and it helped the beginning of the development of diagnostic kits. Uh, they, they couldn't be possible without the sequences that were released and also the development of vaccines. And also now it's becoming important to sequence because you can track transmission dynamics, introduction spread within communities and across countries and then you can also use sequencing to differentiate between new infection, reinfection uh, uh, in, 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 in communities uh, or in individuals. And also uh, sequencing helps us to understand if there are any mutations uh, that could help the virus uh, evade the, the pressure from the immune system. So how do we make sure that we have a very good robust surveillance uh, a, a very good robust surveillance, uh, I mean, the work stream for surveillance, uh, for genomic surveillance really begins uh, with uh, uh, the field and the people that interact with the, the clients, the sample collection, the highest quality samples possible that can be collected uh, and uh, preparing those samples and, and making sure that they are sequenced well and the, the, the techniques that we use in the lab and there's a whole field of bioinformatic analysis. Uh, I'll talk about it later. And also managing the data and sharing the data like we are doing today. This data needs to be interpreted uh, with all its uh, uh, strengths and limitations, but also most importantly, uh, it's important to make sure that it leads to public health action. Uh, it's not just data, just to sit in our computers and nice publications, but we need to use this data for public health response. So what are some of the uh, uh, objectives that we have set ourselves uh, as a team uh, to, to look at uh, genomic surveillance in Botswana is to identify circulating lineages uh, for the reasons that I've already uh, uh, said, to identify mutations or variants of concern. Uh, these could be insertions, deletions that could impact uh, the, the property of the virus uh, or, or phenotypic properties. Uh, and also some mutations may be associated with changes in transmissibility or pathogenicity, uh, severity of disease, or they may affect the diagnostics, uh, the kits that we use. 
So it's, it's always important to see whether we are seeing those mutations that are associated with uh, uh, immune escape, diagnostic escape, or, or increased severity of disease and increased transmission. Uh, in outbreak investigation, I'm just going to show you uh, later on a phylogenetic tree where we try to infer uh, transmission clusters. Of course, uh, um, uh, there's a lot of work uh, still being done there, but we have some data that suggests uh, that uh, gives us an information about what could be happening in terms of clusters. We are also interested in understanding viral evolution, either intra-host viral evolution within an individual. There's one paper out of Deben that shows an individual who was uh, positive SARS-CoV-2 for almost 200 days. And that individual started uh, with uh, uh, an evolution of, 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 of mutations um, uh, within host uh, in an in unsuppressed uh, uh, HIV, showing that there's really a, an important role played by, by co-infection in terms of the evolution of the virus. Of course, we want to understand uh, uh, reinfections. Uh, we've uh, had a few cases of, of uh, uh, reinfections. Of course, the, the definitions can be fluid, but for all intents and purposes, we use like more than, a, more than two months, more than three months, more than four months, and then try to understand if there's anything that we can see in the signature of the virus. And it would be nice in certain cases where you have the first sample and the second sample, and you can do a comparison of the viruses that you see there. Um, one can ask, why do viruses mutate, by the way? And, uh, and uh, it's not that the virus is clever, it's changing itself, but these are actually random mutations that okay due to enormous rapid viral replication. It's not like the virus is thinking about it, but you have this, this viral replication that has uh, lacks a, a, a RNA virus, a viruses that lacks a proof a reading uh, uh, mechanism uh, when they move from RNA uh, uh, in, uh, to DNA via a reverse transcriptase, you, they, there's a lot of mistakes. And, and, and the, the, the faster uh, um, uh, uh, this happens, the, the, the more mistakes happen. There's also immune pressure, the pressure of the immune system, uh, drug pressure, and also some of these mutations, they impair a fitness cost. It's not all mutations that make the virus successful. Some mutations make it wimpy and really uh, uh, get uh, destroyed. Um, now let's look at um, uh, the important aspects. This will become important as we talk about mutations later on, but it's important to understand uh, at least the genomic organization of the virus. Uh, mostly uh, the important thing is the spy. This is the spike uh, glycoprotein, which is important in the interaction of the virus with the host cell. If you look at the virus here, uh, you have um, uh, uh, the, the receptor binding domain of the virus, and you can see the way it interacts uh, with the host cell via the AC receptor. So it's very important to understand that this part here is, is, is one which directly interacts uh, and also is the most target for neutralizing antibodies and vaccines. So that's why this is the most heating part of the virus, and this is where most of the mutations okay. Just to highlight some of the mutations that you may know, the 484 position uh, within the, uh, 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 the spike protein, the 417 position, and the 541. If you look at these positions, 541 enhances uh, binding affinity. So it means that it will enhance uh, the binding of the of the of, of the virus uh, to these receptors, the 484 enhances binding affinity and also confers resistance to class two neutralizing antibodies, and the 417 would uh, work also in terms of abolishing the interactions between the class one neutralizing antibodies, and is likely to contribute towards um, uh, immune evasion. I just picked a few, but there are many other mutations that actually uh, increase uh, viral replication. For example, the 452 position uh, in, uh, in, in Delta uh, uh, is also uh, playing a key and, uh, uh, in, 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 in viral replication. So this is the organization of, of the virus. And just to highlight the non-structural proteins there, uh, the ORF, this is where most our kids here in Botswana are targeting. 
and uh, ORF 1A and B. And then the spike, this is where most of the vaccines are targeting here. And uh, our, our kids in Botswana are not targeting the spike as far as uh, uh, the kids that we know. And then here is the nucleocapsid, uh, which uh, most of the rapid uh, test kits are targeting. So it's important to monitor these areas to see whether we see any changes within our own population. So one question is, so what are variants? What are variants? Uh, so we know that uh, during replication, a virus often undergoes genetic changes that may create uh, what we are calling variants. And some of these mutations, like we say, they weaken the virus and others may yield to an advantage for it to proliferate. Uh, if these changes produce a version of the virus that is distinctly different physical characteristic, then it's called a variant. So a variant uh, 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 that deviates significantly from its viral ancestors from, for example, for the one wild type, what we call the wild type, may be identified as a new lineage. So a new lineage or a branch in the evolutionary tree. We are going to see some trees later on. Uh, so a branch in the evolutionary tree becomes what is called a lineage. So we see that the, the virus classification committee and the WHO, they've come up with these terms, a variant of concern, a variant of interest, uh, a variant of high consequence, mostly used in the US, a variant under investigation, which is mostly used under uh, 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 Public Health England and, 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 and other organization. So it's important, a variant requires one or more appropriate public health actions, probably enhanced surveillance, laboratory characterization, where we take these viruses, maybe grow them uh, and see whether they, they can be neutralized by, 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 by plasma uh, or look at different mutations and see whether uh, they can uh, be, they can uh, produce certain uh, uh, immune responses. Uh, and also you want to see whether uh, a variant can be associated with severity of disease or efficacy of some of the, of the interventions like vaccines would be important. So let's talk about what is a variant of interest. We said there is variant of interest, variant of concern and high consequence. So what is a variant of interest? So a variant of interest, uh, you see it's of interest. It has these genetic changes uh, that have been associated with changes to the receptor uh, 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 bind binding domain uh, that have been associated with reduced neutralization or reduced efficacy. And the most important word here that are predicted to increase transmissibility. So it's not yet, when it's a variant of interest, it's not yet been associated with increased transmissibility, but it's predicted that because of the mutations that we see, it may lead to uh, increased uh, transmissibility. So it's classified as a variant of interest. And uh, the variants of interest are being monitored worldwide. And, uh, and, and that's very important. Usually they have limited uh, prevalence or expansion uh, in nature, but uh, they, they, they just come in this alert list. So what is a variant of concern? A variant of concern has actually been shown to have increased transmissibility and uh, more severe disease, or it's been associated with increased hospitalization or deaths. So that's why it would be called a variant of concern. And maybe some lab studies or, or that have shown that there's reduced neutralization by, uh, by antibodies. So this is very important background I wanted to show. And uh, a variant of concern will have uh, all those properties that I see there. Okay, for the interest of time, I want to delve into uh, the, the, the meat of this presentation, but you see what the variants of concern, some of their properties, you see the R0 and what we mean by R0, uh, it tells you the expected number of, of other people who will catch the disease from one person. So if one person in a contact tracing investigation on average gives us two infections, so you'd call that R0 of two. So that was what the original variant was like. 
But the wave in Europe was characterized by an R0 of three, meaning in contact tracing investigations, one person was responsible or was associated with three other connections. Look at the alpha virus in the UK, R0 of four to five. Come Delta, uh, it changes the ball game. And you can see if we compare with mumps or measles that this is really, really high transmission. And what we've seen here in our lab as well is that if you look at the cycle threshold values, so-called CT values that are proxy of viral load, we have seen that the Delta variant is really associated with, with very low CT values, meaning high viremia uh, in the cases that we have been looking at. Of course, the concern is vaccines. And uh, if you look at uh, some of the vaccines that are out there and uh, variants, there's a lot of data online. So you need really need to, to look at the evidence and the synthesizes. This slide is from CDC showing us some of the, of the vaccines and their efficacy uh, with, uh, with some of the variants there. You'll be interested, of course, in beta, showing that the Pfizer uh, maintains uh, some level of, uh, uh, le level of, uh, of, 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 of efficacy against the, the Delta. The Johnson & Johnson uh, 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 showed some reduced efficacy in South Africa uh, against the, 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 the beta variant, sorry. Uh, the beta variant and 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 those are the other ones there and you can see that uh, initially there were studies showing uh, as well AstraZeneca and the beta so this is very important that this is uh, uh, against uh, hospitalization but if you also look at critical disease you see those uh, that we have data for showing very high uh, levels I'll just skim through one or two studies uh, and then move to uh, genomic data so some of the studies that uh, have just started coming out showing the Delta variant, which is our most interest today, showing a uh, uh, very, very promising uh, data in terms of um, uh, neutralization assays. This is live virus neutralization assay in the lab, which is very important. And they took serum from individuals who had received two doses of Pfizer. And just to jump to the data, you can see that uh, uh, for any dose, if you have uh, dose one, dose two, you can see uh, the average uh, vaccine, effective, uh, vaccine effectiveness there. Uh, and if you look at um, uh, if you look at uh, 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 the, the the other uh, constructs there, you can see that relatively you you have reduced efficacy, but there's still some very good levels of efficacy, better than what was seen in in actually in this in the in the beta variant. And there's more, even more interesting data from uh, 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 studies that have actually looked at real life data. This study looked at effectiveness of, of vaccines against hospital admission with the Delta variant. And uh, uh, I mean, it was a very large uh, sample size uh, and they, they, they looked at, uh, they assessed the risk of hospitalization by vaccination status, they adjusted for for, for common things that we, we need to adjust for. And, and the results were, were very, very nice. Uh, if you look at um, from bottom AstraZeneca, you can see against Delta 92% uh, uh, with two doses and 71% with one dose. If you see Pfizer uh, 96 and 94, uh, if you see uh, any vaccine there. So uh, it shows that the uh, unlike the other variants uh, with Delta, it does look like that there is ro robust uh, uh, vaccine uh, effectiveness, especially against severe disease, and 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 uh, which is interesting. Uh, and um, uh, you be on the lookout of that. Okay, now let's move to our topic of interest. The variants initially, you see that there was an explosion of the beta variant. Uh, let me see whether you can see my pointer. Um, okay, just a minute, technology. Just make sure that I have a pointer that you can, you can see. Okay, laser pointer. So you can see that uh, beta was a, a variant which so-called uh, or, uh, originally detected in South Africa was dominating uh, 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 the world. You can see these uh, nice colors there. Uh, they, they, that's, that's beta. 
And if you see the number of sequences that were generated, of course, South Africa up there, and you can see that uh, there was a relationship between the total number of cases and the sequences generated, meaning we can make good inferences out of this data. You can see the colors that are there really are showing in the delta variant, uh, sorry, the beta variant, uh, 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 the 351, showing dominating in Africa and almost uh, uh, overtaking uh, the other variant. Uh, you can see the data from Botswana as well uh, uh, being uh, 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 considered in, 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 in this analysis. You see Botswana here, and we started really enriching a lot of the a lot of the sequencing from December uh, with uh, first uh, first few sequences um, uh, uh, from from Petri. Uh, very good, nice work, and then uh, uh, and a lot of sequences generated as well uh, with the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute partnership. So this is the picture that you see with the with 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 the beta, and uh, there's a paper there that you may want to to look at, showing uh, the movement of beta within uh, South Africa, and within the regions of South Africa. That really it was spiraled by a lot of movement around there, and it also if you see it in the yellow here, it was almost overtaking uh, 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 the other lineages there, and. Um, and if you see this tree as well, showing a time resolved tree, showing uh, uh, the entrance of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of this variant almost taking over everything. And it's very interesting that uh, while we are dealing with this uh, 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 variant, uh, uh, you're watching soccer like me, uh, some of you, uh, uh, you had to take over the remote in the house. And you can see on the left side, uh, the contrast with what is on the right side, uh, 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 which is really, really a reflection of uh, inequalities in terms of what's happening in interventions in the world. But people are warning that what's happening on the left should really learn from what Israel is now experiencing a new surge of cases because of, the, of, of this variant, which is very important. Um, uh, this is the picture that I, uh, uh, that I want you to see enter Delta. Delta, when it entered in South Africa, you can see all the provinces beginning to really having an explosive epidemic. And you can see an exponential increase of cases. Uh, 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 within a very short space of time, you see this kind of graph. And and I'm highlighting Gauteng and Limpopo here because when we look at the trees later on, you'll see some of the possible connections with these uh, uh, um, uh, with these uh, uh, um, provinces. Uh, this is the proportion of Delta worldwide. And we know that the countries that have been leading in terms of proportion is uh, Nepal, Monaco, very high proportions there, but uh, uh, this, was, this data was, uh, um, a few weeks ago and things have changed rapidly as you are going to see. Um, I've already shown you that. And now let's look at home, uh, 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 home, what's happening at home. So this is what we started doing at home, uh, sequencing with these technologies that are on the right side uh, that uh, we adapted from HIV quickly and uh, uh, to respond uh, uh, to, to SARS-CoV-2. And so far, what we have seen in Botswana, if you forget anything that I've presented, you must remember this slide. Uh, this slide shows that in Botswana, we have generated uh, 735 sequences. And I would like to clap hands for the, for, the, for the teams that have been working. These are whole genome sequences and uh, 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 contributed by the two labs. Uh, and you can see what we, we see uh, beginning in August, uh, uh, showing data from August. So we show that there was this uh, 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 Asian lineages. These are uh, uh, lineages that were circulating uh, in Asia that entered the country uh, um, and, 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 and also in Europe. Um, you will see that they, uh, they were the accounting for the majority of the sequences that, uh, that we have managed to sequence from, from this time period. If you look at October, you also get seeing some of these lineages coming in and almost overtaking these other lineages there. 
and enter the the beta so called um uh, first detected in south africa it was almost getting to 100% and as you can see come april introduction of of of, of delta uh, we uh, delta first detected in botswana through uh, visitors um, from india around the 24th of april 28th of april there uh, where we got uh, uh, the first few sequences that we done this is where delta is entered and you see suddenly see a, a rapid expansion of delta and you can see now delta is now accounting for 81 percent of sequences generated in july 81 percent of sequences generated in july were actually uh, uh, the delta variant which is sobering really really sobering and if you look at on the right of course we have sequenced a lot of samples from the previous months so we still have overall 46 percent of of, of, of beta uh, that we have sequenced so far. But in terms of new sequences coming in per month, we are seeing a rapid explosion of, of, of delta. Uh, A23 dot one uh, is a, a, a variant of interest. Uh, I think maybe it's been degraded to an alert. It was circulating in Uganda, is most of the infections there. And then AY2 is a sub lineage of delta. Uh, which shows that uh, we have, we have proper, probably another sub lineage of delta that is coming is, is coming in the country, and then we have um, uh, a couple of uh, Swiss lineages uh, from Juaneng, uh, and then you have uh, C1, which is also uh, of interest, uh, and uh, we had another uh, uh, we have another sub lineage of 351, which is 351.4, which I'm not showing on the graph right now. So that's the, the, the kind of information that um, uh, we are seeing, uh, which is concerning. And of course, we are showing you 735 sequences uh, that have been deposited online database, but we have actually generated more than a thousand uh, sequences. And we are likely, we need to actually a, a, a countries are encouraged to generate at least five percent of of their of their of their of their cases. So if you look at five percent, we are still far from the target, uh, because if we are at around eight thousand, uh, for example, cases cases, uh, and it means that we really should be around four thousand or so cases. But we are not doing badly in the region, uh, following uh, nicely after South Africa. So let's look at some of our transmission clusters. And I see that uh, I'm running out of time. You'll give me five more, five more minutes. Um, we see a transmission cluster. This is how we use phylogenetic data and these sequences. Uh, by drawing this tree, we are showing viruses we have isolated that are closely uh, uh, related to each other. In other words, they show some close re resemblance. If you look at this cluster here, this is a Kasane showing that probably uh, some transmission events triggering uh, a rapid uh, increase of, of, of Delta in Kasane. How it entered Kasane, we hypothesize whether through the link uh, with Palape, I'll show you why I'm saying that. Uh, and uh, probably uh, introductions uh, from, from, from Zambia, Zim and, and, and Namibia. If you look at uh, this cluster, and if you look at the, the Palape cluster where we have these Delta cases, you can see that there's one Kassane, uh, 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 case that was clustering with the Palape clusters. Uh, of course, there's more work uh, in terms of inferring a, a, a direction of transmission, but you can see that there's likely a linkage here. And uh, actually two of the cases from Palape were actually truck drivers that actually crossed into Kazimbula. But we, they, they, there's more nuances in terms of making those inferences, but it gives us an idea that uh, this route uh, uh, could have introduced another cluster. And then we see another cluster in the south where you see uh, Khaborone Ramutswa. This is probably one, uh, one of the founder clusters as because there are cases here that are originally uh, visitors from India and, uh, uh, and, and, and you can see this cluster 
uh, was also related to, to, to some of the uh, in local infections. Uh, some of the local infections, they clustered here, uh, showing that there was really a, a direct uh, transmission uh, within that cluster. And thanks to, to the DHMTs uh, uh, in, in Palape and, uh, and, and Khaboroni, uh, uh, that really, and, and Kasane, that did, really did a lot of work. Uh, 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 Mamunyere and her team, uh, uh, in, in Kasane and Palape, uh, 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 our doctor there, our head of DHMT there, um, Mamuru PC, and, and also uh, uh, in, in Haberoni here, uh, uh, a team, uh, a team uh, led by uh, Dr. Lar uh, Lawrence uh, that really did uh, this uh, thorough investigation there. Um, so, I was talking about these clusters and why it's important. You can see these individuals here probably related uh, transmission events. Uh, we've colored Havroni red, Kasane blue, and uh, we have Lobatse there. And you can see that these are closely related to each other, signifying possibly some, some transmission events. And it happened to be majority of the schools here. So really that informs us that probably some transmission events uh, and probably related to maybe uh, some introductions. Uh, but if you see also this Kasane, you can see that there are individuals lying in this tree from Khaboroni and, and also from Lobase. No, no wonder why you see also here Kasane and Lobase in this cluster. And then you have the Good Hope, Rakuna, uh, Pizane area, you see another transmission cluster here. And then you have this transmission cluster in Havroni and no wonder uh, Lobase as well. And then you have the few cases of Delta. So this is quite interesting data that we are really diving into to understand the transmission dynamics of this virus. Uh, this is preliminary data that we, we are really working on. And if you just drill down into these clusters, you can actually see groupings of transmissions within each of these uh, communities. And the, the center one is interesting because you can see uh, uh, probably around Lobatse, Pizane, probably this is a transmission cluster. And, and, uh, and if you look at the epidemiological information that you get from, the, from this community, you can see some of these cases are from the schools. Uh, uh, are showing that there's a linkage, probably movement in and out of, 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 of Lobatse and, and these areas uh, explains this transmission cluster. So maybe because my time is out, I will just uh, jump a few slides and show you some key highlights of what's happening within the districts. We see a uh, Havaroni, of course, uh, with 100 cases of Delta. Kasane, 83 cases of Delta. Uh, uh, out of the number of sequences that we have on top there. Uh, Francistown, uh, we have just not sequenced much from Francistown in the recent month, uh, but there still are a lot of uh, beta uh, in, 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 in Francistown. We only have one case that we've confirmed of Delta in Francistown, but I think Francistown, uh, there's more data that is going to come in the coming weeks with more sequences that represents July. The sequences that are here is really early June and before June. So really, uh, uh, we need to treat Francistown with uh, some uh, pinch of salt. Uh, and then Lobatse, you can see the number of cases. Palape, uh, four cases. Uh, Orapa, one case. Uh, we haven't seen any case from Seroe. Uh, Maun, uh, it's because we don't have any samples from Maun in the past two, three months. We are working with Maun. Uh, Pizane. Uh, uh, as you could see from the tree heating up there and, uh, and, and other communities as well. Um, uh, I know I'm running out of time. This was to show you that we are working very hard, capacity building, developing analytical pipelines to handle this large data in the analysis. We are also doing bioinformatic analysis and this paper uh, is, 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 is hot in our, in, our, in our analysis to show this is what's happening. This is Delta. Uh, what you see, uh, uh, this is the, the beta, uh, which is the 351, but this is Delta, okay? Uh, uh, and, and showing that the Delta really entered around 
uh, April, May here, and is beginning to expand rapidly. So in this analysis as well, we also do some uh, Bayesian analysis that helps us to know where are these viruses coming from? We have seen 110 introductions into Botswana with 89 being attributed from introductions from South Africa. We have seen also other introductions from Zambia, Zimbabwe, and India. Of course, we can talk about it this later, later on when we try to understand the introductions and and movement of viruses around the region. And we don't have much time for that today. But what we are showing is that there are multiple introductions of SARS-CoV-2 in Botswana, as we can see from the lineages that are, that are, that are there. And um, I'm sure I've shown you that. I've shown you that. Uh, this is the beta. And last but not least, this is an important slide. A lot of work to the uh, DHMTs we work with when they find uh, outbreaks, they inform us. There's also random sampling that needs to occur on a weekly basis so that we continuously monitor. Uh, we work with the labs in the districts to really look at uh, some of the infections that they have and they do a random sample of, we encourage five to 10% uh, to send to the national lab. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 testing labs, what an outstanding amount of work. 1.4 million, these are unsung heroes of the epidemic. 1.4 million tests already done. Uh, and uh, acknowledge contributions from uh, a number of staff that are listed there, Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute staff uh, and the management and uh, National Health Lab and B3 for, for, for a lot of work in that front uh, and the officers that we've listed there and uh, 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 and also colleagues that we regularly talk and discuss these issues from University of Botswana, Faculty of Health Sciences, uh, Faculty of Medicine and, and Biological Sciences. And also the support that we receive from the, from the Minister of Health, uh, from the Presidential Task Force team, and, and not forgetting the funders, uh, Harvard School of Public Health, particularly for BHP, helped us with uh, uh, seed funding to start this work. And there are some grants that we have applied for that will allow us to expand the work. And we expect that uh, probably in the coming months, uh, we might uh, uh, get uh, some of the funding that we have applied for. And uh, these are the sponsors uh, that are lifted on the, uh, listed on the left uh, that generously uh, given us resources and uh, funding statements below. I would like to thank everyone for listening. And I've gone three minutes over time. And I appreciate the Radicals team, uh, UB, uh, for organizing this event. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Moyo. Thank you for that informative and very insightful uh, presentation. Um, I really believe that um, doing genomic surveillance will enable us to understand why um, other districts are having such high burdens and mortalities compared to the others. So without further ado, I will open the floor now for questions and comments from other colleagues. I see that already there are a couple of, com a couple of questions on the chat. So there's a question from Duelo who is asking whether sequencing can help to detect mixed infections. Dr. Moyo? Uh, that's a good question. Yes, mixed infections, as you saw one case already, uh, is an important uh, aspect of sequencing. Yes, sequencing can help look at whether there are mixed infections or not, but the analysis gets complex. Uh, there's what is called mixed, mixed basis. Uh, within a genome, when you analyze it, you see there are traces of this variant and traces of another variant. And uh, you can actually infer uh, that there is uh, mixed infections. There is also what we call single genome amplification, where you try and tease out whether are there, there, is there more than one virus here. Uh, usually when you see mixed bases, uh, within a position of the genome might suggest that there's, there, there might be two uh, in, uh, uh, infections there. And there's, there's also uh, um, 
other type of analysis that you can do just to track that. And, and, and yes, uh, sequence. Uh, there was a question about lambda. Uh, we we have not seen lambda. Uh, it's important to continue sequencing. You never know when it comes, but we have not seen lambda. Uh, and what is the percentage of variant sequences that are uh, in patients or symptomatic cases? I didn't have time to go through this. Probably when we have more time, we are looking at metadata to group our sequences from symptomatic uh, asymptomatic, uh, severe disease, possible reinfection, to really shed light on this. And we, 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 we don't have data to show today, but it's something that we are looking at. What, does serum from previous infections help with variants? Hmm. Serum, you'll actually show an antibody response. And um, it may not be able to show you directly the variants, but it, if you do, a, a, some assays that uh, we, we, we are heavy with uh, colleagues from UB trying to, to work on, you could see whether there was an antibody response to a particular variant mutation uh, 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 in serology, uh, uh, which we'll see because we are trying to see whether people are, are eliciting some immune responses against certain variants. So yeah, but serum will only tell us uh, only minimal uh, information. Okay, uh, thank Mara. you. Doug. Yes. Um, I was gonna say, Dr. Miela, before I come to you, Dr. Moyo, please address the questions that were submitted prior to the, the session. Cause on registration, registrants have an option of putting in questions that they would like answer during the session. So you can address those. Maybe they will answer other uh, questions that will come. Uh, so there was a question on um, Sinovac. I think you will start seeing a lot of literature around Sinovac and I don't have a lot of data uh, uh, really to talk about Sinovac and Delta variant. Of the literature that I review, there's a lot of data uh, from other agents uh, and not a lot of data from Sinovac. So it's space to watch. Some people are making inferences about the countries that are using Sinovac and looking at the increase in cases. And I think that's not, that, that's not robust science, but uh, I think we, we still need hard data. Uh, like the studies I showed you, that show really vaccine effectiveness uh, without making uh, quasi uh, proxy uh, associations. So I think, uh, we don't have enough data there. Uh, Lambda, we've already uh, uh, um, uh, discussed. The degree of protection, we've already discussed. What causes results to be inconclusive two, three times in a patient testing COVID? I like this topic and I wish we had more time, but just in case, an inconclusive result is that there is a signal suggestive of SARS-CoV-2 infection, but not enough to really to be confirmed. So you know when a positive, we confirm. And you find that sometimes you get a signal, you lose it, you get a signal, you use it. And then showing that probably one, it could be uh, a very, very early infection where there are very few copies of the virus that you can amplify enough to be able to tell. Or very late infection where you see that someone is really clearing the infection. Number three, a degraded sample. Sample that was not collected well where the RNA is degraded. Uh, so we emphasize importance of very good collection uh, to go really into the nasopharyngeal space. We have seen samples that we really reject. And you see, sometimes you see a batch of inconclusives and you, you find that they were collected by one person, which suggests some quality issues. And I think we should address these issues in times to come. Uh, uh, please update on the current genome seeking capacity. We have two labs that have been sequencing so far. As you have seen our capacity there, we are able to generate uh, close to uh, uh, maybe a, a, a 180 or so sequences per week, but it's contingent on staffing reagents and other things. So we are also trying to see whether we can increase capacity. Uh, we are engaging the funders and our principals and Minister of Health 
to see whether we can actually have dedicated funding for sequencing. And so we can expand as a country uh, to possibly other institutions as well sequencing. We have been training some officers both at B3, training officers from National Health Lab, and also at BHP, we have been attaching officers from National Health Lab for the purposes of expansion. But because we are short staffed, they get easily pulled back to uh, uh, testing again. Uh, is there a difference in outcomes between COVID positive who receive Pfizer and Sinopharm? Uh, there, there is a concept that is being written to look at uh, 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 vaccine effectiveness and another one being written to look at immune responses and that will be able to compare some of these products. Uh, so uh, not data yet, but some people are already thinking about it and we, we can't wait for them to generate that data. Which variant are dominant since June 1 uh, is the Delta. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Um, Dr. Charles Muyala, if you are not answered, you may quickly ask your question. We are running out of time. Dr. Charles. Okay, maybe we lost him. Let me see what else we have on the chat. Uh, um, they, Dr. Malone is requesting that you show the slide with breakdown of variants by location. Doc, Dr. Smith, um, your administrator just allowed me to unmute my mic. Um, a common population such as hello. hello? Hello? Uh, sorry, I was mute. sorry, I was mute. Dr. Smith? Hello. Um, okay. This is the slide I was asked to show by uh, Dr. Bridget. Yes. Um, I don't know if she has a question on that, but um, on the chat, there's just a comment to say it would be interesting to see how key populations such as sex workers play a role into the entrance and movements of the variants, especially new ones. And they are asking if you have any. Dr. Moyo? Yes. Uh, you were cutting, but uh, I, I, I think the, the movement really, I wouldn't, don't know whether we should attribute movement of these viruses to certain key populations. Uh, that could be important, but at the moment we do not have data uh, uh, to suggest that probably a certain segment of the population might be helping to spread the virus. But we know any any type of movement, uh, uh, such as suggested, could could contribute, but we don't have data. Okay, thank you, Doc. Um, I think any more questions will be. Uh, communicated to Dr. Moyo privately. Um, we have unfortunately run out of time. I will give Dr. Kaulati now to give the closing remarks. Thank you again, Dr. Moyo, and thank you to your team for the work that you are doing. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Moyo. Um, this was a very um, enlightening presentation. And I would want to believe and hope that it, it is in two parts. Um, so um, I see we had to rush you through some of um, the key slides, but really I think this is one big area that everyone is interested in. And uh, hopefully the next also talking to vaccines and where we are in Botswana. And uh, the next few weeks also um, continuing on some of the presentations from the different DHMTs, which we found also very informative and, and closer to home. 
I think with all that we have for today, um, we are yet to confirm our lineup, but we will have um, our webinar on Thursday. Thursday is as usual, 4 p.m. And uh, to thank all and the team that put this together and have a happy long weekend. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, everyone. Good evening.